Good evening and welcome to The Square. Tonight is a very timely discussion as always where we talk about medical negligence and patient rights in Rwanda. I think many of you have seen uh, some of the cases in the last few days, the last few weeks. Um, you know, there's a growing number of medical mm -hmm. negligence cases, um, you know, malpractice uh, suits that are coming up against various um, health practitioner um, institutions. And we're here to just discuss, you know, what are the core reasons of this? How do we address these issues? What mechanisms are in place to sort of deal with this uh, thing? And here we have with us um, a patient uh, rights advocate, uh, someone who represents a, an institution that has really been doing lots of patient rights uh, advocacy, as well as um, the regulatory body, um, so to speak, that puts in place mechanisms where patients can seek um, legal redress when it comes to med medical negligence. And I'm happy to welcome our guests. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Albert Nzaisenga, who is the Secretary uh, Rwanda Medical and Dental Council, uh, as well as a consultant of orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Nzaisinga, we're very happy to have you on the square tonight. Thank you very much. Also joining us is Christopher Sengoga, who is the head of human rights and litigation at HDI Rwanda. Christopher, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Great. My name is Dan MPC, um, host of The Square. As always, I'm joined by The Squarest and panelists. Uh, looking very sharp in a nice sleeveless black dress, we have with us Berna. Uh, I wonder, if, is this made in Rwanda? No. But, but uh, what in Rwanda? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard Namata, also resident panelist of The Square. Charles Haber, resident panelist of The Square. Great to have you on the show as always, Charles. Good evening, Diana. How are you? Good. Yeah. Like we always do before we kick off, just a couple of midweek highlights from The Square resident panelists. Bernard, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to share with our viewers. Um, what's caught your attention in the week that, thus far? Um, there's, there's a lot that's been happening, so I'm kind of trying to figure out uh, which one to talk about. Um, Saturday, Sunday, we, we had the nightmare of uh, volleyball. Um, quite unfortunate. Um, I don't know, for some reason, um, the event suddenly became low key. Um, you know, uh, the closing ceremony, it was the PS, not the minister, why? You know, um, and I've been waiting for some kind of uh, apology to the Rwandan volleyball players who are victims of this, you know, uh, because we tend to focus so much on, 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 on the foreigners. But we, in this case, think about these Rwandans who have been uh, training so hard and looking forward uh, to the tournament, and then they are disqualified for reasons out, you know, beyond their control. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really, uh, it was shocking. Uh, we are still trying to get our head around it uh, because there are so many things that are unclear. But I think um, the Minister of Sports needs to do more for Rwandan, um, Rwandan players, but, but in this case, the Rwandan volleyball players who did their part mm -hmm. and are victims in this case. Um, yeah, so f I'll stick to that. Yeah. yeah. Incidentally, it's, it's interesting because we had our, um, our show last week was on how to grow the sports sector in Rwanda. And we talked about issues in terms of governance when it comes to federations. And I think this is a result. This is one of the negative aspects of, you know, the sort of governance issues that happen in federations. These are some of the fruits. And yeah. it's, it's most unfortunate. Uh, yeah, and, and also you see that um, so far we've seen um, there's been talk of arrests and as expected, it's the small fish. Some heads had to roll. Yeah, like there's no oversight over the small fish. Mm. And uh, if you speak to people, uh, they will tell you that most of the time, some of these small fish are simply told uh, to sign. Yeah, and in the end, they are held to account for some of the decisions that uh, their superiors would have actually endorsed. Mm. Yeah. True. Charles, would we highlight? I wish I could comment on that one. <laughs> Because it's conflict of interest. No, 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 it's sort of an issue of conflict of interest. I was going to talk about uh, clubs and bars being opened in the past by yesterday's, uh, <laughs> yesterday's uh, uh, communique. And I think, um, I think it's around COVID. COVID is coming back to normal. Businesses are going to wake up. Uh, times have been increased. And I think it's a great opportunity uh, um, for, 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 for everybody. If you look at, uh, at the ecosystem, or the value chain of, of uh, bars and clubs for that matter, 
you know, the supply chain of whoever is selling the food, uh, the bouncers and who they feed, the commercial sex workers and who they feed, the, the guys who sell alcohol and the, the taxes that they pay, the wines and spirits uh, importers with their 120% taxes that they pay to RRA. So it's going to be, everyone is going to be laughing when bars and clubs are open. Mm -hmm. But Charles, is, yes. it, is it true that bars were really closed? Uh, officially. <laughs> officially. <laughs> Good question. Um, yeah, so thank you very much to our guests, um, Dr. Nzai Senga and uh, Mr. Sengoga, uh, representing HDI Initiative, uh, sorry, HDI Rwanda, as well as the Rwanda Dental and Medical Council. Um, before we kick off, uh, I would like to just read a couple of tweets um, from some of our people, our viewers, who've been uh, commenting before the show started, you know, for the benefit of our guests. Uh, just to proper prepare as well. And uh, the first tweet we have coming in is from uh, Sujira, who says that it is too easy to judge mistakes just because they are found, but it is better if we do not only blame those weak caregivers, but also all those people who are unethical in medical centers, health centers. There are still some issues which are not resolved, like few doctors. Uh, we're going to go to our next tweet. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is the doctor-patient ratio in Rwanda. Uh, like Sujira talked about a few doctors we have another tweet coming in that uh, is from uh, Mudisha Dani, who says, it's a very interesting topic. When someone says the medical service provided with negligence, I wonder who is judging. Remember that medical practitioners also feel the pain of, lo of losing his or her patient. Uh, hashtag sympathy. And uh, our last tweet coming in is from Rita Diana, who states that medical practitioners should feel sorry when they have given their whole, but in the end, the patient dies not when they're negligent, very important topic. And she goes on to say that the consumers are the judges. So uh, those are some of the, you know, the tweets coming in. And um, yes, uh, you know, like I said earlier on, the topic is medical uh, negligence uh, and, and, and the patient rights and uh, what measures are in, uh, in place to address these issues. Um, I would like to go now to our you know, our guests. And uh, the first topic uh, in this, you know, three-part uh, topics uh, for this conversation is to do with just looking at medical negligence and the medical liability law, which has, you know, we'll be informed by our guests here um, why it's taking long to come to fruition. And um, if you'll just allow me to read, um, according to the Rwanda Medical and Dental Council, and these are figures we have, I think they need to be updated, but this is what we have so far. Um, cases of medical malpractice doubled from 12 reported in, 24, in 2014 to 27 in 15 and 36 in 2017. Um, this figure is slightly reduced in 2017, but there's been a sort of upward trend since then. Um, the most culpable um, departments are gynecology, pediatrics, uh, and surgery. So first of all, I'll, I'll start off with you, Dr. Ndai Senga. If you could just share with us what are the, the different implications between, between medical negligence and medical malpractice? Yeah, thank you, uh, Diane. Uh, medical negligence, uh, it would imply uh, the failure to exercise a care that uh, a prudent practitioner would not, would not do. So there's two persons doing the same care. One will uh, do it more imprudent so that it can cause harm. Uh, while uh, malpractice, uh, we take it as uh, when a professional, a professional, a medical professional or a dental professional is uh, doing a care at a substandard level. So. Uh, this is uh, very important to know because uh, a, a medical m negligence can be taken as a malpractice, but the reverse is not. Is not. Uh, malpractice is, ca can be negligence, uh, but uh, no, negligence can be malpractice, but all malpractices are not negligence because mm -hmm. it's a professional who is doing uh, care, who is giving care at a substandard level. So this is how our law applies. Thank you very much, Dr. Nzai Senga. And uh, you know, if you could just, we are now going to open this also for you and um, um, Mr. Christopher Singoga. Uh, what are, right, currently in, in Rwanda, what are the options uh, when it comes to um, victims of medical malpractice to win lawsuits um, against, you know, the, the, the responsible medical institutions in the country that 
have harmed uh, their patients. How do people s seek redress, legal or otherwise? And I'll start with you, Dr. Nzaisenga, as, as we go to Christopher. And before answering this question, uh, Dr. Nzaisenga, if you could share with us also the role of um, the Rwanda Medical and Dental Council in helping patients uh, seek this, this um, redress. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, currently, we are cooperating uh, with uh, other institutions that are dealing with malpractices, especially Rwanda Investigation Bureau. Anytime a patient feels or the family feels that uh, there is a harm, there is a damage to, uh, to, to, to relative, uh, it is very important to seek uh, help from either RIB or RMDC, Rwanda Medical and Dental Council. Either one uh, of the institution uh, collaborate, uh, collaborates with uh, its, its uh, counterpart to establish the link between uh, what happened, the damage, and the, the medical negligence or malpractices. So to be brief, uh, any time you feel uh, uncomfortable or harmed uh, by the medical professionals or dental professionals, one of those two institutions can help. So you seek uh, their help and uh, they work together to, uh, to give a uh, fair uh, trial to what happened. Mm. And I think we've seen in the media, you know, there have been cases of, um, you know, um, people seeking you know, um, redress and uh, people have been awarded either by the Ministry of Health um, on behalf of these uh, medical institutions, um, you know, a couple of really unfortunate stories where we've seen a couple of people seeking and receiving legal redress. Christopher, if you could just share with us, you know, the work HDI when it comes to patient rights uh, advocacy, you know, how, what in your opinion, how, how, how is the landscape when it comes to medical uh, negligence and patients, you know, filing medical malpractice suits. How? What are the returns? Is has it been? Has it proved fruitful? Um, in your opinion, has this kind of, you know, lessened the cases? Because what we're seeing is a sort of growing trend, at least in the last two years. Thank you so much, uh, Diana. When you look at our medical professional li uh, liability insurance law, it is twofold. It has one component that stipulates about the rights of the patients and also the responsibilities of a medical or healthcare uh, practitioner. And uh, when you look into the two concepts, one being medical malpractices and medical negligence, the law uh, deals with both in a way that uh, it gives the right to the patient who is a victim of any malpractice or negligence to bring or to sue for the compensation. But if it is of a grave negligence or malpractice, the law also gives a loom under its Article 25 for the patient to go and bring an action to court where the investigation can start to determine and ascertain the cause of negligence or much practice that has been sustained. Currently, I would say that um, there is progress. We have seen some victims of such negligence taking actions to court, and we have seen the court being progressive in a way that some courts have awarded compensations um, to the victims and their families. Uh, but the challenge still exists when it comes to some patients who don't know that they have rights under the law and some medical practitioners who don't also know the law, that the law enshrines the fundamental rights to the patients who would seek redress. But I would say for those that have gone to court, they have sought some redress, and some cases have been had in court where uh, medical professionals and healthcare providers, some have been punished uh, with sentences depending 
on the gravity of the case that uh, is sustained or that has been investigated. So I would say that however much there is a need uh, to do a dissemination, a wide dissemination, to do awareness, so that every citizen can get to know that he or she has comprehensive rights embedded not only in that law, but even in other laws, even the constitution or other laws that can be read together or implemented together mm. as the medical liability insurance law. Thank you. And if you could just share with us, why has it taken so long for this medical liability insurance law to come through when it comes to mechanisms to enforce it? it, it, it is, you know, what's, what's the holdup? I would say, um, actually the law was put in place in 2013. Yes. If we calculate well, it's almost nine years. The law has been in existence. The only part of the law that has laid is establishment of district administrative committees who sh should be responsible to assess, determine, and give redress to patients who have sustained some injuries or damages caused by medical negligence. Currently, uh, the law provides that ministry in charge of health should have established a ministerial order to determine what the committee should be doing, how the patients could complain, and how the remedy should be sought. But as we are speaking now nine years, mm -hmm. there is no committee that is regulating such, which makes it difficult for the patients now to be left with one option of going to court. Because the committee is not in existence to determine if the negligence has, has there is a causal link between the negligence or the damage sustained by a victim. Mm. So I would only see that the implementation of the law mm is the problem, but the law has been in effect for almost nine years. Yeah, um, it's a tragedy, you know, to know that the law has been in effect for 10 years, but, you know, the implementation of it, mechanisms of the law, where people can use it to their advantage when they are victims of medical negligence, is still something that is an issue. So just before I go to Bernard and Charles, Dr. Nzai Senga, how does RMDC work to enable people you know, what do you do? Do people come to the RMDC offices and so do they write a letter saying this happened to me and then you take it up to, you know, to, to Ministry of Health? How does it work when the issues of medical negligence uh, from it, because you're the regulatory body, from it going from a complaint to actually from going to court? If you could just share the sort of a procedure or process. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, what we do actually once we get a complaint uh, we establish a professional team of investigators uh, to go to the site to interrogate uh, the concerned or, or stakeholders. Uh, first, we uh, go to check with the files of the patient. We can talk to the patient if the harm was not that big to cause uh, big damage or fatality. Uh, we question uh, professionals who were uh, involved in the treatment on the management. We uh, also look at the family members so as to establish uh, the, what the, 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 the medical profi, pro, uh, pro, professionals ha have done to, to the patient. So uh, once the team uh, finishes the investigation, they bring a report to a PCC. It's a, it is a, con a professional conduct, uh, conduct committee which analyze, analyzes uh, this uh, report and decides on that. So once this uh, process ha ha has finished, this report goes to the Bureau of uh, Rwanda Medical and Dental Council 
this bureau composed of uh, uh, eight to, to ten people. So we look at what the law establishing the Rwanda Medical and Dental Council uh, tells about the negligence, and we classify which role the practitioners, the practitioner or the practitioners uh, got in that case. So once we have established the, the role and we classified uh, the degree of negligence or malpractices, We've got uh, four types of, uh, of sanctions that can apply. We can implement, we can suspend, uh, we can suspend, we can blame, uh, or even if the serious uh, malpractice, if there is a serious malpractice, uh, we can also suspend forever the practitioner. Uh, those are, this is uh, the step we pass through to establish and take, to take action. Yeah. In addition to that, once you find that the damage is, is beyond the scope of what we do, if it is criminal, we can hand this case to other organs that deal with the, uh, criminality because it can be out of the scope of Rwanda Medical and Dental Council. So uh, there is one thing that I would uh, tell you today, that malpractice and negligence can have killed much people, uh, not in Rwanda, uh, also in other places. Like 2017-18, uh, in USA they counted over 250K of death uh, following malpractices. In India, the same year, it was about five millions of people. But consider how uh, the immensity of India. So it is uh, uh, something that is worrisome uh, to regulatory bodies and to the population that professionals serve. Uh, what we try to do is to make sure uh, we decrease or we advise people on how to decrease those malpractices where possible because you can't uh, live in a world where human beings are not uh, having errors mm. in their uh, daily practices. Thank you very much. Um, Varna, over to you. Would you like to comment on what our guests have said? Yes. Um, it's indeed sad that, like you said, that uh, we have a law and uh, it's not uh, being put to, put to use because of the missing technical aspects. Um, and, and there's a trend, it's a trend actually, uh, we see with even uh, uh, some of the other laws. Uh, we tend to have laws that are there but somehow can't be utilized because there are other aspects that are missing. I, I can't use the legal terms that uh, the lawyers uh, would use, uh, but it's a big problem. Mm. Uh, because on one hand, you are su you're supposed to have the tools and then they are not there. Now, going back to the public outcry that we've seen in, uh, in recent weeks, uh, one, I think we must uh, give the doctors a benefit of doubt that they care so much about their profession and resist the temptation to jump onto the public court of opinion, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, secondly, I feel that the doctors also should not be judged by random events. Now, going back to what we need to do, um, we must not forget that uh, the doctors that we have are, or the healthcare providers that we have are a product of a system. So if you're going to address uh, malpractice or negligence, you better address the systematic issues uh, before you even get to litigation. Uh, because I, in my view, I don't think litigation is so much of uh, an incentive in terms of deterrence. Yeah? But if you can at least say, uh, to put it simply, if you've given the doctor 
the right uh, working environment, then you can question them if something happens, mm -hmm. yeah? But when you talk to some of these professionals, they will tell you issues that they have with the system, as is today. So I would shift the discussion to the regulator, who is supposed to enforce and also take care of the environment within which uh, these practitioners do their work. Because in absence of quality assurance, then the cases will be inevitable, even when you have litigation uh, going up. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, the awareness uh, of what the patient uh, is entitled to, but also on the medical practitioner side. Again, there's a gap. Uh, these laws are passed, and there's not so much awareness on both sides, obligations, responsibilities, and enforcement. Um, so, I mean, typically, you go to medical school and you're studying medicine. You're not studying law per se. If you want, you could go ahead and maybe specialize in mm. <laughs> medical law, but, you know, um, typically medicine is very separate. Now, if the law is passed and the doctor is not aware of their obligations in what is likely to happen, then we have a problem. Mm. On the other hand, if the patients are also not aware of their rights and the provisions in the law, then you still have a problem with enforcement. So I would take it backwards and say, can we first improve the structure? Can we first improve uh, what the Ministry of Health is doing before we crucify our professionals? Mm. My final submission would be on um, the other trend that we are seeing, um, where some of these uh, professionals are, are sent to jail. Um, we have an issue around uh, the criminal justice system uh, because it is called, I think when the, the prison service is called uh, correctional. They run the correctional services. Yes. yes. The key yes. word there is correctional. correctional. Now, I haven't looked at the numbers, but you want to go back and check whether it is indeed correctional, meaning you don't have repetitive offenders. Yeah. Now, when it comes to medicine, if we are sending our professionals to jail, we already have a problem with the racials. How are we helping the situation? Because for every professional that you send to jail, there's a gap. Yeah. And going back to what uh, the, the professional body is supposed to do, uh, perhaps there's room to do more for their, for their members. Uh, one, whether it's providing them with uh, the legal support that they need. Uh, two, enforcement of the standards and, and the professionalism to kind of deter escalation of issues to litigation. Yeah, I, I feel that uh, as professional bodies, and it's a general problem, mm -hmm. we tend not to focus on what we can do to improve the conditions of the, our members. So in the end, you find that uh, most professional bodies are in the business of dealing with issues. They're not focusing on, you know, yes, empowering their members, uh, you know, to, to, to do better uh, professionally, uh, whether it's ethics uh, and even, you know, taking up complaints. Um, so it's, uh, it's a tough one. Mm. It's a tough one. Uh, it's, it's very delicate uh, because it's lives here. Um, there's no replacement once you lose a life. Um, or once you lose a limb. Yes, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very delicate, but it, it also requires that we, we take a harder look in the mirror and, and see the reality of... The system in which we operate. We operate. Or our health practitioners yeah. operate. Yeah. Great points. Uh, Charles, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Um, when you, when, you, when you look at uh, patients' rights, obviously the first thing you ask yourself, do patients actually know their rights? I know there's a, there's a requirement from the Ministry of Health that uh, 
the patient's charter should be hung up across all uh, medical establishment and that's by regulation. But when you go there, the charters are written in like Times New Roman 8 font and you need a magnifying glass mm. to actually read, uh, to look for the word patient in, in that whole thing that's about five charts across. Mm. So you'll actually not pick it out. Whereas as you're seated there waiting to see a doctor, you'll see a very big board about an activated uh, sign about how activated or activated or paracetamol <laughs> is good for your throat and, 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 and ulcers can be cured by this drug and there's this baby being carried and there's a drug next to it and you know. <laughs> so the, 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 the subtle adverts of medication are, are louder than the patient's chatter. So you ask yourself, um, what is the message that these guys are trying to, uh, and uh, Daktari, with no offense meant, even if I called you a guy. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just for purposes of emphasis. So I, I think the communication there, in my opinion, it is, it is deliberate that, you know, the, the patient is not as important as selling the drug. And uh, I think Banner raises a point really around uh, uh, saying that c can we be, if we are a professional body, can we make sure that the, the, the virtues that they stand for are actually communicated? Mm. Because I am almost 100% sure that most of these establishments, private and public, have patients' charters hung up on their walls just to tick the regulator's box. Mm. Then you move on further and then you say, um, if you're to look at, at, at the other patient's rights, for example, is, 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 do I know that it is my right to complain that I came for a two o'clock appointment and I saw the doctor at 6 p.m.? Does the doctor know that he has a right, uh, sorry, an obligation to explain to me why uh, he was four hours late for my appointment or he saw me four hours later um, and so on and so forth. But I think English does not help either because by definition you're a patient, so you're supposed to be patient. <laughs> um, mm. So you, 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 you find yourselves in situation knowing that um, uh, the good orthopedic surgeon who has accepted to join us on the show today is one out of every one million people. So if you get an opportunity to, to, for, to, to see him, you are, you are extremely privileged and therefore you will be patient. So it, it, it is a very difficult uh, 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 situation, but I think uh, just for purposes of emphasis, I think the, 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 the patient's char charter, the same way you go to every establishment today in COVID times, and the, the, the communication around COVID, wash your hands, sanitize, keep a distance, and all it's, it's in your face in medical establishments and otherwise, in public places. I think some of these patient charters uh, and, uh, and uh, sort of in bullet form and what to, to patients to be able to know their rights, I think we do not know our rights. And that's, that's one, of the, that's one of, the, of the challenges that we have. The second one that is sort of, uh, uh, in my opinion, related to that is um, quite often when you go to a medical establishment and the doctor writes a prescription for you and tells you go through an MRI scan, and you have seen this quite a lot, let's say go to a CT scan, go to an MRI scan, uh, and uh, go to Banner's establishment specifically. Uh, you have been seeing, um, uh, if, if you follow, and some of the insurance companies have been complaining a lot about this, that somebody is compelled to go through some of these very expensive medical procedures because of unethical practices that uh, certain doctors will have deals with uh, diagnostic centers. Now, it may sound that I'm going off topic, but you know the radiation that your body is being taken through when you're spending those several minutes in, 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 an, in a CT scan or an MRI scan or whatever scan that is. Then you, sometimes you ask yourself, how many patients are going to ask, do I actually need to go through that scan? Today, 
all what almost all the insurance companies have done, the medical insurance companies, is that they sort of require that you pre-approve. Because it is, causing, it is causing them significant losses, and that's just on the diagnosis part. I won't talk about surgeries, mm. you know, where patients are taken through unnecessary surgeries, but just because somewhere along the way there is more money to be made. Mm. And th s some of these uh, unprofessional, uh, unethical uh, practices, uh, you ask yourself, do the patients actually understand their rights that, uh, that they are being used as tools to enrich uh, somebody else. Was that surgery extremely necessary? Was it extremely necessary to amputate me, this, you know, my leg, or, or for, for, for that matter? You know, I, uh, we, we could give quite a few examples, uh, 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 but the, the only challenge that we should usually have is that in the medical practice, it's very loud because it leads to a fatality and a, you know, loss of life is, is the worst case scenario. But do we have to wait for a loss of life to have a conversation like this? So uh, I think it's really the onus is on, on the guys at the, at the council to, to um, uh, employ or better communication techniques such that uh, patients are able to know their rights a lot better. Mm. Yes. Um, I want us to go to the issue of patient rights, but of course before we do, Dr. Nsai Senga, uh, would you like to weigh in on what some of the issues Ben has said? You know, she's talking about looking at the landscape, the system in which we operate. Before even, um, you know, like she said, going to crucify some of these health practitioners, you need to even look at, you know, we are looking at the doctor-patient ratio. You're looking at hospitals that probably don't have enough equipment. You know, you're looking at the graduates, the training. You know, there's that. And Charles is talking about unethical practices that have some sort of monetary gain to medical practitioners. If you could just touch on that briefly before we uh, delve in a bit more on the issue of patient rights. So, uh, on the pa patient's rights, currently they are exposed everywhere. Some, and uh, we are trying to make it bigger than before. Mm. But, but uh, once you make it bigger, it raises an issue too. First, you have right to choose your doctor. If a patient has to choose about, uh, among orthopedic surgeons that are in Rwanda, we are not yet 20 in mm -hmm. number. In so totally, in, that, in, the, in the whole country? In the whole country. We, we are training others, but we are still very few as orthopedic surgeons. So if the patient has, has to have to choose, it won't be easier for them to get doctors. It is only in Rwanda that once you are at the hospital, you will see a doctor uh, uh, at Vienna So th there, there is a need and law enforcement that any patient in the hospital must be seen by a doctor. So those uh, rights they have, they have rights to refuse treatment, rights to, to sign a consent to information, all of those informations are, are there and highlighted. The issue would is just the number of doctors that we do have. So we have very few doctors uh, in, in this country. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm jumping to talk about the ratio. We are one over 548 per, per one patient. One doctor to more than 504 hundred patients. So this uh, creates a, a big gap. It's like uh, five times folds compared to WHO recommendations. Mm. Uh, so if you talk about law reinforcement about their rights, is there but it possibly is delaying because as your colleague said, uh, institution-wise, do we have enough doctors to treat them? Do we have all infrastructure to, to, uh, to help them? But a lot have, have been done. Uh, now, nowadays, you, we can't have a child di dying of diarrhea uh, or dying of, of malaria. This has been achieved. So now, what we want is to increase the number of doctors including GPs, general practitioners, and specialists, especially to increase the number of spe specialists in the domains. 
because many of the cases, as uh, Diana said, are in gynecology, this is a specialty in pediatrics and surgery. On, uh, at the base of the healthcare system, things have been improved to treat all those emergency diseases that would kill uh, children, even adults, uh, because the system would be negligent. But today, as we have uh, gone through those uh, difficulties and we are okay with that, improving the quality at the higher standard, at the uh, big institutions, teaching hospitals, enough doctors, enough equipment, and, uh, and uh, this ethics teaching and a more professional uh, talks to, to increase the way we treat patients will make sure the law is discussed well with institutions, especially Minister of Health and uh, Finance, to make sure that the patients can now uh, go through those institutions to be helped. Mm. I don't think it is only district issues, district uh, committees that are delaying. It's just building this arsenal of inf infrastructure and human capacity to make sure that what uh, that the law is starts to, to 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 be implemented in a very in in a very responsive or uh, comprehensive environment. Uh, thank you, uh, Bernard. Just very, I would like to go to uh, Mr. Christopher. Christopher, you know, we are talking about patient rights, and uh, one of the things that, you know, in particular for me, caught my attention is when uh, patients, when it comes to referrals, and I want to ask you in your experience, you know. Um, what, what does HDI also really advocate for? And maybe you can go back to this, Dr. Zaisenga. Uh, when we look at uh, patient rights and we look at um, hospital referrals, uh, personally, I've lost people close to me because, you know, one, you know, um, clinic or hospital does not want to give a referral in time. So what happens is that you see that, um, you know, transfer documents are not given in time or the doctors don't want to give a, a reference um, to another hospital, whether it's a district or provincial or that sort of thing. And when they do, it's always to the detriment, not always, but in most times to the detriment of the patient when it becomes a, you know, a, a, a fatal case of fatality. Patients have the right to ask to be transferred or their family members, you know, when it comes to some of these issues. When it comes to patient rights and hospital referrals, um, what is your experience in this, Christopher? And I'd like to also hear from Dr. Nzai Senga later on. Uh, thank you so much. Um, when a citizen goes to see a, a medical practitioner, he or she trusts that this qualified person will do in appropriate manner to relieve pain. And he or she, as a patient, thinks or presumes that a health provider will do according to the standards and ethics. So there it now brings two things into interplay. There is a right and an obligation. When I come to see a health provider, I expect that before he proceeds with any procedure, he has to tell me that according to the diagnosis, this is what, what is happening, a right to information. We are going to do ABCD as a procedure. It is going to cost ABCD as a cost. Can I afford it? Now it goes back. This is a right to information as a patient. Now I know that I'm suffering from A, then this is going to be done. And if a doctor is unable to go ahead with the procedure, depending on the facilities that the health facility has, then I'm entitled to referral. That is my right. Because I have got the information. After I've had what is supposed to be done, and the health facility is unable to do it, then it calls for transfer, it is my right. And it is an obligation for a doctor to refer the patient where he or she feels that he cannot manage the procedure. Mm -hmm. Now the two things are coming into interplay. 
one. You have gone ahead, even before, if you can manage to do the procedure, I have to sign a consent. If I have not signed a consent, now there is a negligence on the part of a doctor. If I sign the consent, and during the medical procedure, you have provided a substandard service, I am entitled to the standard service according to the facility, and a doctor who is trained with the skills to do so. And if a doctor does not really understand what the law stipulates and the law regulates what the doctor has to do, I would equate this to the taxpayer. They know when they should pay taxes. If you are in a certain field, at least you should know these are regulations, these are do's and don'ts according to what the law provides. In, in, in the experiences we found that I personally, I want once escorted a 16-year-old young girl to a medical facility. She had to go through the procedure diagnosis. And after I requested the doctor that, can we have the medical record? Can we also take it home with us? He said no. But I did it intentionally because I wanted to know to see if the doctor really does understand what the law stipulates. Then I asked, what is the problem? Because I have a right to information and then to access the copy of my medical record. Whatever I would do with it, it belongs to me because this is my right. Then the doctor told me, you know what? It is unethical, you see, it, what if you misplace it? whose record is being misplaced. <laughs> it is my records. Mm. But first of all, in, in most cases, I believe you two have ever gone to see or to any medical facility. They will do everything and then they tell you or they give you some. When they are discharging, sometimes they give you a receipt that you have fully paid and the facility. And entitled to a medical a record. report. Report. Yeah. I should go with it, actually. Yes. And if I want... A summary of your... A summary of what they have treated me. And if I want a referral, according to the system, I can get it. Or I can even, because I have a right to consent, I have a right even to refuse the treatment and decide uh, for it. Christopher, thank you. I'll have to cut you short. Um, this is a good lesson you're giving us. But uh, I want to just quickly go to the social media feed um, very quickly before uh, you know, I, I just go over to Brian and Charles. So the first question we have is from George, if we can have that on our screens, who asks that, um, is misdiagnosis negligence? So that's the first question. Um, we'll come back to you, Dr. Albright, to answer that. And then we have another question coming in, um, sorry, comments from Umutoni, who says, I would like to ask Dr. Nzaisenga, how do you call the case of two doctors who fight to take care of a patient for the purpose of getting money? This is what Charles was alluding to. Because 70% of the operations uh, cost go to the doctor. Uh, those are two questions for, doc for you, Dr. Nzaisenga. And then we have another tweet coming in who says that, um, um, I think once people understand that medical service is a passion rather than anything else, we will see more medical negligence and poor customer services than we often face. Um, so just over to you quickly, uh, Dr. Nzai Senga. Um, is Ms. Dev Moses negligence? And what, what's your you know, response to the issue that uh, some of these are to do with uh, you know, unethical practices uh, looking for monetary gain? Yeah, uh, misdiagnosis can be taken into, it can be negligence or incompetence. Why do we call it uh, negligence at some time? Uh, it's because, as we said before, you, do, you are not exercising diligently with the prudence. You, you don't ask accurate uh, paraclinical investigations or thorough uh, history taking, and you miss a diagnosis. So when, when you cannot reach a, an otherwise simple diagnosis at the, uh, your level of professionalism, we, we can call it negligence, uh, but most of the time we call it uh, incompetency. Mm. And those doctors who do not, who miss those otherwise 
uh, easily accessible diagnosis, we can uh, make them uh, some suspension and retraining uh, so that they can acquire uh, much, much information about uh, those kind of uh, diseases. Uh, very quickly, uh, the issue about uh, money. Very quickly, we have less than five minutes. So it's, it's unfortunate that we can have doctors fighting about money, but the ratio of 70% of, uh, of do money uh, being taken by a doctor is not... Uh, is not uh, it's not accurate. No, no, need, to, <laughs> no need to my knowledge, uh, but uh, it would be unfortunate to have doctors fighting for that. Yeah. And the money should not be number one uh, for a doctor while treating a patient. I agree Can I you. comment on uh, We money. have less than five minutes. Yes. I would like this to be your final comment. Yes, it will uh, be. And Brenna, over to yes. you very quickly. Charles. Yes, the issue of money will be my final comment. Uh, I think, first of all, it's extremely important that the medical practitioners are paid well and, uh, and, and motivated uh, very well for two reasons. One, Rwanda is striving to be a medical tourist hub, uh, a hub and, and destination for that matter. Mm -hmm. So we, we are having issues. Some of our best surgeons, best uh, consultants are, are, are paid 20,000 francs for consultation. Uh, how are we going to how are we going to attract the best or get get the best Rwandese who are out there to come and consult here? So I think uh, so in terms of retention, yes. let us have remuneration to doctors. Yeah, yeah. especially yes, especially this whole thing uh, of, 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 of consultants. Yes. If we can afford to go out of this country when we run the medical referral board has, board has sent you somewhere and you're paying $100 to see a good uh, uh, specialist, we may as well pay Thank that. you, Charles. To, uh, Brenna, very quickly. I agree with you, Charles. Yes. yes. In terms of retention, very quickly, please. Uh, one, we need, we need again to improve the functioning of the system. Yes, like you said. Create before. yes a yes. pipeline of incentives that facilitates mm -hmm. patient safety mm -hmm. at the same time takes care of the doctor's interest. Finally, we must strengthen professional bodies. Mm -hmm. From what he can, from what he's saying. I mean, he's already overwhelmed with his clinical work. Mm. And then you're piling on him administrative work. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. So I, I feel that there's more that can be done in terms of strengthening professional bodies to actually do the work they're supposed to do. And you can't have a practitioner who is already overwhelmed administration doing administrative work I agree. It, it just doesn't work totally agree um this is a topic this is the i think second or third time we're talking about <laughs> this topic next time of course we'll have different panelists i saw on social media some people asking us to have some of the people uh you know people advocates of, of for patients um absolutely Thank you so much, Dr. Albert Nzaisenga. If we could have our cameras on them. Uh, thank you so much also, uh, Mr. Christopher Sengoga. Much appreciation to you, Christopher and Dr. Albert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie, always a pleasure. Uh, yeah, always great to have you on the show. Yeah. Brenna, great to have you on the show as always. Thank you for your succinct points to the both of you, to our viewers. Thank you very much for tuning in, uh, sending your views. Keep the conversation going using hashtag the square RW. Um, to our partners, uh, Bourbon Coffee, as well as Uzi Collections, thank you for always supporting the square. Have a good night. See you again next week. Thank you.